But there's one thing, I guess we should start off at the top of the program before we do any reviewing, that we would like to discuss, and that is the newest season, season four of Dark Side of the Ring, is going to debut this coming Tuesday night, May 30th. And uh, once again, to answer a lot of questions I've been asked, I'm going to be featured fairly prominently on a few of the episodes, but specifically one that uh, we talked about last week on the program. The debut this week is on Chris Candido and Tammy, and obviously I was involved in that one. So at any rate, at this point, what we're going to do is through the miracle of technology, we're going to go with a conversation that I recorded here very recently with Evan Husney, one of the creative forces behind Dark Side of the Ring, and we talk all about what you're going to see on season four. So, Brian, if we can punch those buttons and play that funky video or audio, that would be lovely. <laughs> all righty, through the miracle of modern technology, he is on the line with us now. He's in a foreign nation the nation of Canada, so there may be a slight time lag as the audio has to clear customs to come across the border. But nevertheless, one of the creative forces behind the Dark Side of the Ring empire, along with his partner, Jason Eisner, it's Evan Husney, everybody. Thank you for being here, Evan. Hey, Jim. Thanks so much for having me back. I really appreciate it, man. Thanks. Well, and I get... I said your partner, Jay, uh, you guys are business partners. You guys wear many hats and this, uh, the whole creative enterprise sprung from you guys, but it's not like 50 years ago, I would have been calling you guys longtime companions. You're simply platonic <laughs> business partners. I will a connotation of that. That's Burbage right. That's changed. right. Yeah. He's actually shooting some reenactment scenes right now as we speak. So that's why he's not on the program. Um, but yeah, we, the, the season is not finished. <laughs> We're still delivering these episodes as they are airing. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty, pretty crazy. Well, and I know that, uh, I, we mentioned last week on the program, the debut of season four, dark side of the ring on vice TV is going to take place this Tuesday, May 30th, 10 PM Eastern time. Mm -hmm. And I, Evan, I got to say, I know this is the most popular program in the history of vice television, but do they really expect you guys to pull them out of bankruptcy single-handed in 10 weeks? <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of pressure to put on. Are, are we going to be able to see all these episodes we're going to talk about here in this interview? I mean, is there is it close enough that there's somebody at Vice Master Control ready to pull the plug if they get the, the smoke signal? Or do we have some, some breathing room here? I, I saw a picture of the Vice offices. All the employees were wearing their hats. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, well, as far as the situation, I mean, I'm not an official, you know, uh, who can comment on the bankruptcy situation. But I thought you know, they gave we... you guys like 25 percent of the stock to, <laughs> because of the hit program. Oh, that would be fantastic. But um, the way that uh, we understand it is that everything is uh, like everything is business as usual. Um, the TV channel is actually a separate entity from the main business. Um, and so is vice studios that also does a lot of the production. So, um, yeah, so we, we are kind of separate from the situation that's going on with the main media entity. So what you're saying is even if some dominoes start to fall, you guys are far enough down the line of that setup on the Ed Sullivan show stage that you guys are going to get your 10 weeks in before anything happens anyway. So good. We got confidence here now. Um, oh, yeah. We're in, good for in, a while. In all seriousness, I'm glad this is coming up at this time. It's, you know, it's uh, dark side of the ring season always turns a young man's thoughts to fancy <laughs> and or chaos in the world of wrestling. But the the debut episode this season is one that, I know you guys had been bandying the idea around for a while and had been wanting to do it. And I'd been obviously in favor of it, but I said last week on the show, I like the way that you did it because it's Chris Candido's story and Tammy is in it. Mm -hmm. And cause Tammy has been told and, and done and commented on and the whole tragedy there mulled over but in that time chris has gotten a, uh, obviously 
overlooked in a lot of ways, in a lot of cases. And in this instance, this program, it's Chris's story and Tammy is in it. You couldn't tell it without her, but right. it focuses on a lot of Chris's friends and his family, his brother, Johnny, mm -hmm. um, his mother. So, you know, just, when you started out, when you guys started out shooting the footage, uh, mm -hmm. did, did you have it in your mind it was going to turn out this way or is that the way it evolved? Well, um, to take like a few steps back, we had always wanted to do this story ever since I think the first season. Um, it had always been on our radar as a story to do. We had actually corresponded with Tammy, you know, during her various legal situations um, over the years. Like, you know, she'd be, you know, in jail and we, we wrote letters and got them into her and she wrote us back letters. Uh, trying to put the episode together all the way back then, and it never quite lined up where we were in production and 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 she was able to do the interview and stuff like that. So when when it finally got around to this season, we were just like, okay, no matter what, regardless, you know, given Tammy's present uh, legal situation, we were just like, we're going to go ahead with this. And then the idea was we're going to still try to get her in the episode, which we did. We actually... Uh, we're corresponding with uh, some of the uh, folks on her legal team um, in order to see if we could get permission for an interview. How Ultimately, big is her legal team? <laughs> how, how, well, how numerous <laughs> is her legal team? Is Cochran well, you know, in there has... and Darrow and... and... <laughs> well, you know, she has, um, I think, you know, personal legal stuff and she has the criminal side. So it's a team. It's a team. Um, I think more than one is a team. And uh, ultimately, the the criminal uh, legal side decided that it would be, you know, that it wouldn't be maybe in her best interest to do the interview and heavily um, basic, you know, told her that she shouldn't do it, which I understand with a trial coming up, you may not want to sway a jury one way or the other with something like this coming out. So um, that so we had started filming the episode really with Chris's story in mind. And if we were able to get Tammy on camera, we would have pivoted to maybe something much larger, maybe a two-part episode, maybe something that really was both of their stories, you know, uh, combined into one. But uh, we always were pretty much favoring uh, the Chris Candido story and going to commit to that. And basically, we, we got word that Tammy wasn't uh, able to do the episode pretty much at the last possible second. And then we just, com then, then we fully committed to Chris's story. And I am glad that we did uh, you know, Chris Candido, I was a huge fan of his as a kid. I was a, you know, big ECW fan growing up and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it was really cool to, as you said, he is really kind of underappreciated. I think, you know, if Chris Candido were around today, he would be a much bigger name. I think his style, um, you know, kind of was forecasting the wrestling style of now. And I think his size being a smaller, you know, guy is much more in style. So I think like, um, he, he, he really was this really influential, um, amazing unsung talent. And I mean, his finishing move, the power bomb off the top rope always blew my mind <laughs> every time I saw it. I couldn't believe that was like, that was like the craziest finishing mood I'd ever seen as a kid. So, um, yeah, it was and, just really cool you know, to be able let, to tell the story. Let me say this, yeah. I've because I said, and I say in the episode, Chris, if he was around today, would be one of the bigger stars in the business. Yeah. Um, and he would have had, trying to figure out how to say this, he would have had a better influence on the in-ring guys today if he was still around to be able to talk to them mm -hmm. and teach them things that he had learned rather than them imitating him, because it's much like, even though Mick Foley still are, people imitated the the dangerous part of Mick Foley without having the talent and the mental mm -hmm. grasp of the business underneath. Chris was an old school wrestling fan who knew that he had to do that stuff to get noticed and turn it into an art form, but he broke his body down at an early age. Yeah. But toward the end, he was starting to realize where he could have picked and cho chosen his spots and his things a little better and he always had a mind and a love for the business to teach guys things that he had learned and to learn and blah 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 so mm -hmm. that's what i wish about chris is that he's not around to tell guys here's how i was doing it here's why i was doing it 
And in some cases, here's why you shouldn't do it. Cause I mm -hmm. figured that out too late. And he was, he was, he was that kind of guy that he could have done that. Yeah. Cause, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I seem to remember when we did the interview with you, you were telling us about his time in Smoky Mountain when he kind of first came in, that he was like going crazy, taking all these crazy bumps and falling out into the floor and the concrete and doing all these things that maybe weren't entirely necessary, but was just like his immediate instinct to try to, you know, make a big well, impression, yeah. right? He was trying to get over it. He was doing all the crazy stuff he did on the independence in New Jersey. Right. When they didn't really know who he, he was, just another guy. It was just guys doing moves. There was no TV. There was no defined, <laughs> you know, reason, logic, universe behind this. So he comes down there and the people are like, well, shit, that looks like it hurt him more than it hurt the other guy. Right. Because they were used to kind of shit that made more sense. And, and who is this guy? And once he figured out, get them into your personality and then they will go crazy over shit you do. Right. It, it, right. You know, that was. That was his, and then, you know, getting in the ring with the Rock and Roll Express or Mick Foley or uh, the Armstrong family or any of the veterans, uh, you know, young and old that he was able to work with, he learned so quick. And that, that's he, something else I was going to ask you is, mm -hmm. you know, when you got the, the pictures of Chris, when he was a teenager, from his yeah. mom and his brother, when he was already, you know, running his own shows and making his own matches up and making his own yeah. championship belts, that was some cool stuff that even I had yeah. not seen. And it shows that he kind of had a mind not to just play wrestler, but to actually be wrestler from an mm -hmm. early age, going to the trouble, because all the other guys get on a trampoline in their backyard, <laughs> he found a fucking guy with a real ring running real shows and bullshitted his way on it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's one thing that I think is really cool uh, for for viewers to see with this episode is just that, you know, from a very young age, Chris made this decision. I mean, probably five years old that like I was going to become a wrestler no matter what. And everything he did in life was to fulfill that dream. And I think you see it very clearly, you know, when his brother is showing that upstairs attic with all these just old, you know, drawings of Ric Flair and Roddy Piper and these old like handmade toy rings. And it's just like, it's amazing. Like, you can just tell that from, you know, five years old, this kid loved wrestling and was going to be a huge part of his life forever. And then as you said, like we kind of, you know, because of the runtime constraint, we kind of gloss over it. But he really was putting on these local shows at an extremely young age of like 14, maybe even younger, where he was able to finagle a ring. Any of the wrestlers, like the, you know, like the, the, the like professional wrestlers who lived in the area, he would book them and get them on the shows. He would make all the belts, the merch, like the entrance, you know, and they had music. So it was this real DIY sort of production he was doing. And then, of course, you know, he was also wrestling in Brooklyn, taking the bus down there, you know, lying to his, you know, to his parents that uh, he was going to go sleep over at his friend's house. And then he'd basically take the bus into Brooklyn and they would do these shows when, you know, he was 14 years old, uh, wrestling other guys, somehow sneak on the show and, um, you know, get color in these matches and stuff. And it's crazy. That's crazy. But I mean, I love it. I mean, he's just a diehard for the business, you know, but that's, and what, that's what when, when, when I first met him, he was inquisitive and you could tell he was sharp and he was kind of with it as yeah. Frank Spaceman Hickey used to say about the wrestling <laughs> business. Cause he'd still, he'd been around at that point for a while. But one thing I wish that if Dennis Corluzzo was still around, he would have been, possibly yeah. the star of this show uh, right. because he had such a big part in pushing Chris on everybody that he knew because he believed in Chris and he was right. Yeah. And also what a character he was, but besides, uh, you know, Dennis be not being able to be a part of the show. I thought uh, Tom Pritchard obviously was close with Chris in Knoxville. And then later on the brief run as partners. Yeah. Um, and Lance Storm had a lot of affection for Chris. And that's why I said last week on the show, you you somehow in 45 minutes plus commercials managed to get Chris's brother, Johnny, me, 
Tom Pritchard and Lance Storm all to break down and cry and walk off camera over somebody. Yeah. I guess what yeah. I'm saying is, is, did you find when you were doing this that everybody universally had almost nothing but praise for Chris. Did you on the other side of the coin have anybody even offer to say, Oh, Tammy, you got her all wrong. <laughs> it just, it ain't there anymore. Is it? Hmm. Well, I think with respect to Chris and just, you can really tell in the episode how much, you know, what a great guy he was and like the connection that he had with everybody in the episode, including yourself. And um, I think also there's just a lot of empathy for Chris because everybody knows the struggles he went through and that this was a, you know, how important the business was to him and all the sacrifices he made. But also I think everybody, you know, ha was very, you know, observed that relationship you know, that he had with Tammy and knew what he was going through and what he probably had internalized for so long. Um, and I think that, I think, yeah, I think that's, that's hard to look back at, you know, uh, whatever, however many years now it's been almost 20 years. Um, so that, I think it really shows just the effect that he had on, um, his peers and how well beloved he was. I, I haven't really heard anything bad about Chris from anybody ever that we've talked to, even outside of the folks that are in the show. Um, I think with Tammy, and I think you can attest to this too. It's like, cause you had both of them you know, when they were kids, you know, they're still what teenagers or just out of high school yeah. going into college. And I can only imagine just how surreal it is when you see both of them. So young, impressionable, innocent, you know, bright eyed, bushy tailed coming into this business and then knowing how it's all going to wind up the roller coaster on the other side of where they're both going to wind up and kind of being brought into this business, chewed up and spat out a little bit, you know, and where it goes is just kind of almost unfathomable, something you probably could never have predicted, right? You know, the only thing I will modify of what you just said is Chris, to an extent, got some chewing and some spitting. Yeah. Tammy chewed her own arm off. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, she did a lot of her own chewing. So, <laughs> and and that's that's the thing is I think now it's just, it's, it's so sad that it would have been wonderful if there was one redemption out of this, that uh, Tammy, after what happened with Chris, had uh, suddenly managed to get herself yeah. together in some fashion uh, to uh, provide some positive end of the thing, but hers is worse. Because mm -hmm. he never hurt anybody else but himself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I said, and anybody who wants to know my full current feelings on uh, Tammy. They're on the YouTube channel at length. You can look them up from when we heard about the, yeah. the accident in Florida. So I'm not going to go into that. Otherwise than I was one of the holdouts for quite a while. I was like, well, maybe at some point mm -hmm. she will, you know, calm down and get it together, whatever, because I did feel bad, not only from seeing them, when they were the fresh faced teenagers, but mm. also I was somewhat willing to make excuses for, her for some period of time when she was only embarrassing herself because mm. of, and, and I was also willing to make excuses for her when nobody else particularly liked her personally, because I liked the talent. I I could, I could identify with somebody being an fucking aggravating fucking bitch or whatever. Cause I liked the talent also, but, at some point in time, you know, she's lost any support she had from anybody, and it's, you know, due to her own actions. Yeah, I guess what I meant by that, too, was that was the time in wrestling, especially in the WWF, where it's like Soma Central, you know? And I, I yeah. just, um, obviously I wasn't there or anything, but this, the experience of hearing the stories, again, a runtime issue of, if we had more time and what we could get into is just the horror stories of, of the Soma abuse in this, in this relationship is, is quite scary, you know, because for me, it's like, you know, a Soma, a muscle relaxer, it has its purpose, but taken in excess, it basically is like, turns you into a walking zombie, you know, in a yeah. lot of ways. And, 
And they both would be using these recreationally for, you know, days on end um, in mass quantities. And there's a lot of near death experiences, a lot of car crashes, a lot of freak outs um, and a lot of things that, you know, Johnny and other family members had to, you know, come in and try and save. And there were overdose near overdose instances. And it's just this horror show. And I think like, you know, it's that thing where once you're introduced to it, uh, you know, via a locker room, a colleague, whatever, and when that one pill isn't enough, and then you got to take six for it to work, and then it's 12, and you have the schedule you have to keep up, you're on the road 300 days, you're putting your body through so much, especially him and ECW and all that stuff, and then it just, ca- it just catches up to you, and then it just becomes something and probably in Chris's case, which I think Johnny does say too, is that it was not only just purely for the pain management, but also probably for the emotions of what he was going through too, because I think their relationship was emotionally fraught. There were a lot of um, pretty, you know, dramatic, violent situations going on and, you know, a lot of fights and scary stuff. And so I think, yeah, I think he was probably using it for that too. And yeah, it's just, yeah, it's an incredibly sad story, <laughs> you know? You yeah. know, all, all all chemicals or elements have their useful purpose, but sometimes a couple of them just don't mix correctly. Right. And yeah, things happen. Right. Uh, but there are but instead of giving him the entire episode here, we will tease them with that <laughs> and say that the debut is this week, Tuesday, May thirtieth, for Chris and Tammy, Vice TV, ten o'clock Eastern time. But uh, the this is the kickoff of a 10 week season and Mm -hmm. next week um as a matter of fact i guess i'm in the first three episodes so apparently you really are (laughs) trying to pull vice out of bankruptcy with my face just you're hot shotting evan the whole thing but next week is going to be the story of magnum ta which is a a, a dark story in a different fashion with a at least somewhat uplifting ending and obviously maggie's still with us um Mm -hmm. but that again is another you know what if story of a young person that was destined for some greatness absolutely um when we were making tales from the territories last year and we were working on the jim crockett episode it was floated obviously when we discussed having magnum on the panel for the show and we had him on for a very long time and then we had to move the production I won't bore you guys with the reasons behind that, but we had to move it to Los Angeles and it became too far of a trip for him. But I'm so glad that that actually worked out because uh, it it just, because we were talking about kind of summarizing that story for that show. And I'm so glad it didn't work out that way. And we sort of said, well, you know what, let's, because we knew we were going to do season four. So let's save the Magnums, you know, his story for Dark Side. I'm so glad we did. And you're right. This is an episode that does have um, a a happy ending. You know, he does overcome um, these injuries and is able to live a very fulfilling life, you know, from the accident and everything. And this has been a highly requested story that we do for a very long time. And I'm so glad we did. And, you know, because he is modeled after the Tom Selleck, you know, uh, Magnum PI vibe. And it's very eighties, you know, this episode has a lot of, you know, mullets and mustaches and so on and so (laughs) forth. So we, so we did kind of lean into the eighties, you know, movie of the week vibe, I would say with this episode, you know, because his story kind of mirrors like a made for TV movie (laughs) at that time uh, in in a way. And so we kind of gave the episode that aesthetic, which I think is very fun Um, And we just really got into it. I mean, you know, the stakes were really high for Jim Crockett promotions at the time. They were sort of looking for their, you know, big, you know, if you will, Hollywood star that could take the company to the next level and the competition with the WWF. And they sort of cast Magnum in this role. They found, you know, the aesthetic that would best suit him and and what would really propel them. And I think what's really cool what fans are going to see, and oh man, I love about this episode, is we have a little montage in there about, you know, when Magnum's at the height of his powers and he's and he's doing that best of seven match with Nikita Koloff. And it's just amazing. I love that. I love seeing how, 
you know, it starts with Magnum down three matches and then, uh, and then he evens it up three to three with, you know, um, um, against Nikita. Then of course, Nikita wins the heel prevails in the territory. It's amazing. It's just incredible storytelling from like the best period of wrestling. And, um, that's fun. But then of course you see like, you know, Jim Crockett's got a lot of eggs in one basket here with, um, with Magnum. And then this unforeseen tragedy happens where he gets into this car accident, um, and it derails everything and plans are completely thrown out the window. And, you know, he may never walk. He's told that he may never walk again and going yeah. through that whole process. And obviously kayfabe era, I, 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 I love just, you know, how they would sneak Ric Flair, Dusty Rhodes in the heels <laughs> into the hospital to pay him, you know, so, so they could, well, he could you pay know, their respects. Here's the thing, Doug Dillinger, who later on would become famous uh, or infamous on WCW Nitro yeah. as the head yeah, of security, yeah. Doug Dillinger was a Charlotte City police officer. Oh, and yeah. he was able to arrange things that sometimes, you know, you couldn't just do on your own. And Flair and Tully and Arn, JJ, wanted to see Magnum, but because of the, it was, well, as you saw when you did the research, hysteria in the mm. city of Charlotte, there was a oh, yeah. vigil at the hospital and people had it staked out and they were given updates on all the TV news. So mm -hmm. it, the four horsemen couldn't just walk into no. the hospital under that kind of surveillance. So Doug Dillinger was able to, in the middle of the night and undercover with a police car and a blah, 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 sneak them in the back door and up the stairs where they could visit Magnum while he was in the hospital. I love that. Yeah, that's I, I love that. And that's definitely in the episode. Um, but yeah, it, it was awesome. I mean, I mean, Terry Allen was awesome to work with on this episode. Um, and yeah, it's it's it so to me, it, it's one we should have done a long time ago. But, you know, you got to save some for later, for sure. Well, it's 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 a great one. And you talk about the grittiness with him and Nikita and that best of yeah. seven. Just say that's why Magnum is famous for the I quit match with Tully. Uh, mm -hmm. at Starcade because Magnum was, he was the epitome of what the NWA was looking for in a top baby face, superhero, ladies man kind of guy, because it, he wasn't, he wasn't funny. If, if he'd have gone to the WWF and Vincent said, start smiling. Yeah. Magnum was a fun guy, but he didn't have a big smile. He was a serious face guy, but the people bought him even when he was green because yeah. he was so, intense and he could portray violence and anger believably and that's what the nwa fans were looking for and that's and they they were just in awe of that in him because he had that fire yeah no you're 100 percent right yeah it is that grit of the territory that's you know in contrast to you know the sort of cartoony side if you will of, of wwf that it would be and it is and that was was super eye-opening to me because Obviously, I knew Magnum TA, and um, I'd seen some of those matches before. But just the process of making the episode, man, I just had a whole new appreciation for truly just how, yeah, amazing he was. Like, just such a perfect uh, baby face in all regards. You know, just it was, it was just incredible. So that's well, cool. Hey, and you're also, yeah. Me, yeah. me and the Midnight Express worked with him in January 1984. That's when he'd been in the, in the business period about two years. This is uh, two and yeah. a half years before his wreck. And you talk about intensity. Besides when he was green and stiff with those comeback punches, he would get a look on his face like he was legitimately pissed at you. And Bobby and Dennis would almost <laughs> duck. When he was coming to make a comeback, he's like, fuck, what's the matter with this fucking guy? But that's what, you know, he had that. And then he would hit him with the stiff fucking green punches and they'd go, God damn, he really is mad. Um, yeah. And it's also just he, real quick. It's just, it's just, it's incredible how, like you said, he's two years in the business. Like it's amazing how he went from super, super green to the, to the main stage, like very, very, very fast. Um, and of course, we tell that great origin story of um, Buzz Sawyer, uh, you know, basically working him for uh, ten grand <laughs> to train him, you know, which is um, which is a pretty sad, sad but funny story that's in the episode as well, too. Well, th that is the second week, and in the third week, we'll give him one more teaser involving good old James E. This is one that I had pitched for and or supported or whatever for some yeah, time. Campaigned. 
yeah. uh, campaign even and got petitions mm. signed. But uh, <laughs> the story of the Graham family, specifically Eddie and Mike Graham in the modern generation, but involving also superstar Billy, who just passed away, and not only good old Crazy Luke, but Dr. Jerry Graham, the 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 originator of the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, um, you, Dutch Mantel, a lot of folks had had been just kind of insisting that we do it. Um, and, of course, with Tales from the Territories last year with Championship Wrestling from Florida, doing that episode, we got a lot of, you know, amazing stories about Eddie and, and um, kind of got in that zone, you know, from there in order to do this. Um, and yeah, it is obviously a very, uh, incredibly tragic story. I kind of compare it in a way to the Von Erich episode we did in season one, only in that it's kind of a familial generational tragedy, you know, kind of relentless tragedies in one yeah. family where, you know, you have suicide kind of passing down through the generations as this kind of head, um, this kind of hereditary thing. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, Eddie Graham, just one of the greatest, you know, minds of wrestling ever, one of the most influential, innovative promoters ever. And, you know, his, I think it was his father or was it his uncle and his father also took, took their own lives. And yes. then of course, Eddie would take his, his son, Mike, who was obviously a wrestler as well too, would take his lone life. And then Mike's son also committed suicide and it's just this kind of unfathomable story but um the title we landed on for the episode is breaking the it's called breaking the cycle uh the graham dynasty and that's majorly because we got mike's daughter in the episode and it's a very unique perspective because she taught she was around for all of it every aspect of this uh minus of course you know eddie's you know father and and brother or right. um, uncle but she basically talks about being the survivor of this, and she's the one member of this family who's going to break that cycle. And she really talks about how in the in that family, in the Gossett family, that's their real name, how when you know one member of that family decides to make that choice um, with suicide, that it kind of makes it a viable option uh, for everybody else. And so her big stance, you know, through raising awareness locally in Florida. Um, to really getting out, you know, uh, raising, yeah, just raising more awareness generally for mental health um, causes and things like that. She's really here to be the one to really stop that, you know, put a stop to that in her family. So it's an incredibly tragic story, um, but it does get to the heights of, you know, uh, the Grams at the height of their powers. It does take a detour into Dr. Jerry Graham <laughs> for, you know, probably your showstopper story of the season. Um, well, and, well, you uh, know, it, it, you can't, you can't put on the cutting room floor, a man stealing his mother's corpse from a hospital. But yeah, the, it, when, when, when Billy Graham passed away last week ago now, and, and we did, uh, Brown and I did the, uh, the podcast and talked yeah. about him. You know, it's, it's amazing that that family, we, we drew some parallels, the Graham family, both Gossett, which was Eddie and Mike's real name, as you said, and Jerry was the only real Graham, yeah. but the Graham family and the McMahon family were intertwined yes. in various ways for 50 years from Dr. Jerry being a huge draw for Vince senior, but a pain in the ass because he was alcoholic and mentally ill, but he was Vince senior or Vince juniors favorite yeah. wrestler because he was an alcoholic and mentally ill and crazy. <laughs> and then Vince senior came to work with Eddie who did have the functioning alcohol alcoholism, but was a respected wrestler and promoter and businessman for 20 years. While at the same time, Vince junior mm -hmm. patterned, Hulk Hogan and everything that he would do in the wrestling business after superstar Billy Graham, yep. the final, you know, gimmick member of the family, who was the biggest box office attraction in the world for Vince Sr. And he still took the belt off of him and sent him into a downward spiral yeah. of depression. So it's yep. it's amazing that those three generations and and then Shane was a you know huge superstar Billy Graham fan. He was right. like 
the Dr. Jerry to Vince Jr., mm -hmm. Shane was to Billy or whatever. It's amazing what they couldn't get away from each other. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, for, for expectation reasons, um, I will say that when we did get to putting the episode together, you know, interviewing Nicole, which is, you know, Mike's daughter and, uh, you know, Kevin Sullivan's in the episode, you're in the episode, putting it all together. It really was, wow, this is the story of Eddie and Mike and the family. Um, and of course that detour with Dr. Jerry, and it was tough to do any sort of justice to, you know, superstar in the episode because of just, you know, we wanted to really tell the story of the Gossett family, really. So we right. did. And, you know, but hey, you never know. I mean, maybe now Billy Billy Graham's story is, you know, ready to be told for a future season. So that's something we should definitely be looking into. Well, also for the rest of this season, rattle it off real quick and let us know who else we're going to be yeah. looking at or hearing about. And sure. uh, then we'll plug it one more time. Okay. Okay. So, um, so that was week three, the Graham family week four, we're going to be looking at the story of Matt Bourne, um, uh, AKA doink the clown, the original doink the clown. Uh, I have to admit this episode, um, going into it, I was like, I don't know what the doink the clown episode is going to be like. And it is pretty crazy <laughs> from top to bottom. Um, and uh, I will tease and say that maybe a little unexpected uh, avenue this episode goes down is it actually has a uh, th – there is a lot of, you know, mysterious circumstances surrounding Matt Bourne's death. So there is a true crime angle to the episode as well, too, that we went pretty deep on. So that's kind of a surprising twist in that story. Um, but, yeah, Matt Bourne, you know, yeah, one of the best territory – wrestlers um another unsung sort of talent and then of course everybody remembers doink and so it's 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 a peek into the creation of that character and how it really was kind of a twisted uh, extension of matt himself so there's that um week five is the junkyard dog um episode which we just finished up um you know pioneering you know black star of the territories you know um jim you're in that episode as well too snuck you in there um, <laughs> well, I, and, mean, I, uh, I know it's once again, you have a public to consider. You have to please. Them. <laughs> we have a quota. We have yeah. to, to. Um, but yeah, I know it's, it was, uh, you know, we had, we've told a lot of junkyard dog stories over the course of the show and on, especially on territories as well too. And so it was a great opportunity to finally do this and to really trying to get to the heart of Sylvester Ritter, the person, the man behind, uh, the character, um, yeah, and it's, it's, there's actually a lot of folks in that episode, uh, that we've never had on the show before. So stay tuned for that. Um, so that is week six. Uh, no, sorry. That was week five. Week six is one I'm really excited about is the Adrian Adonis episode of the show. And it kind of is, or a large part of the episode is dedicated to the crash, uh, that took his life, which has sort of lived on, I feel like, as a kind of almost a legendary tall tale in some ways. Like you kind of hear these different details and rumors over the course of the decades since Adrian's passing. Uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, he was traveling with uh, three other wrestlers and they swerved uh, to try and uh, not hit a moose and the car, you know, crashed into a ravine. Um, and it took Adrian's bear, life and everybody now, else. Bear, bear in mind, they were in the wilds of uh, Northern Canada. Newfoundland. They, yeah. Newfoundland, they yeah. Newfoundland somewhere. They weren't like yeah. over in Poughkeepsie. Yes. No, you're right. Yeah, exactly. So it's this kind of like a rural wilderness area. Um, and, and this is really exciting because we did get to speak to the only person who survived the crash, uh, which is one of the Kelly twins, um, who tells his story for the first time. Um, which is very emotional, very intense. Um, with I that. didn't, I didn't know either one of them were still alive. It, it, um, yeah. Well, obviously, I knew one of them went alive, but I didn't know the other one. Yeah. Uh, was still. I actually saw them wrestle in person forty-five wow. years ago. Yeah. Wow. That's how old yeah. I am. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's. It's. He. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, he he lost his twin brother in that crash, and it's it's crazy. And so we get into you know, um, the story of the Kelly twins a little bit, we get into what, what, what the hell is everybody doing in Newfoundland, you know, to be in that situation in the first place. And there's like, and then we also talked to Ricky Johnson for that episode, Rocky's brother, who was just about 15 minutes behind them, uh, in this crash in another car. And he's kind of the first person on the scene. Um, and he attests to some things that I won't want to spoil. So check that out. Um, 
the Adrian Adonis episode. Very excited about that one. Okay, the next week, week seven, we have uh, Jim's favorite topic, which is Bash at the Beach 2000. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're going to be getting into, you know, um, every every season needs to have one, um, for lack of a better term, incident or, you know, uh, one episode that's kind of about like one moment in time. Um, and we love one, those episodes. One, one illustration of a stupid promotional tactic. Sure. Well, 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 you know, season one's got the Montreal screw job. Season two, you know, um, got into the brawl for all. Season three got into the North Korea, the 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 um, collision in Korea pay-per-view. And so this season we wanted to do something that was about an event because we love doing the event-based episodes because, you know, it's hard to jam in all this biographical information into one single hour. Um, but when you get to do one event, it lets you really get into the details and sep- try to separate, especially in this case, fact from fiction, maybe the hardest episode to determine what really <laughs> happened ever. You know, the th- thing about this in Montreal, when Vince tried to double cross somebody, at least he made a fortune out of it. <laughs> they try to double cross <laughs> somebody. They go out of business in WC <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's a chance to do an episode, dare I say, that's quote unquote more fun, you know, something that doesn't end in, you know, total tragedy. Um, the happy side of the ring. It is. It, it is. It, it is a fun story. And then from fun into crazy wild, we get into for week eight, we do um, Abdul the Butcher uh, as a story, which I've been very looking for. I've been mean, always wanted to do uh, one of my first interviews I ever did for the show way back in 2017 or 2016, I think, whenever it was, we were super green and we interviewed Abdul the Butcher and I was so intimidated and terrified by this guy (laughs) when I first met him. I mean, he worked me left and right. I left without any, you know, I left with an empty wallet, let's just say the whole time. (laughs) And, uh, oh yeah, it's, it's classic. Yeah. Yeah. Took him to Red Lobster and he ordered the entire menu for, you know, it was amazing. Anyway. Um, but it was Lobster Fest. (laughs) <laughs> not even actually. Um, but anyway, so, uh, Abdul, the butcher, when we first met him was super protective, you know, kayfabe to the grave was never going to open up about his real story uh, or any type of, you know, background on, you know, Larry Shreve, that's his real name. Yeah. And so, um, it was when we brought him in for territories, uh, last year for the stampede episode, he and his entourage, and he's still rolling deep with quite an entourage there. Um, they basically came to us and said, you know, Abdullah is now ready to tell his story, you know, um, sort of like, Oh, we got to jump on this. And so we did. And so the episode kind of looks back at his origin story, his pre wrestling days, you know, coming from, you know, poverty and Windsor, Ontario, Windsor, Ontario. And then also you can see how a hustler is born like a hundred percent right there. And well, you know, uh, then that, that's course, the thing. Yep. Abby was always, he was a, a, a lesser to a lesser extent version of the Sheik in that he protected his gimmick and et cetera. There's, there were details that were known, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, but not that he would divulge, but for the most part, you never liked the Sheik. You never heard Abdullah talk or say anything to any great extent or reveal any of his, you know, previous life. I mean, all the way up until like when I met him, I mean, I'd seen videos of him on the internet, you know, like t- taking a fork to a journalist's face. You know, I was yeah. terrified when I first met this guy. I was like, what am I expecting? Um, but uh, no, it was a great experience this time around to get that story. Um, there's, there is again, a lot of separating fact from fiction there, I will say. And it also gets into obviously his legal troubles of the last, you know, several years, um, you know, specifically with, the hepatitis C quote unquote incident for lack of a better term and what he's going through now. So, um, it does, it does get into that. Um, and then week nine, we have a personal, personal favorite of mine. We have the Bam Bam Bigelow episode. Um, one of my favorite wrestlers growing up as a kid, absolutely was Bam Bam Bigelow. Just to me, like I didn't, it didn't even get a sense that he was like, I, I just thought that was him. There was no gimmick. Like he is just that guy, you know? (laughs) I mean, he is, you know, it um, wasn't far, it wasn't far at, at, you know, at some point, sometimes they had him do some outlandish things on TV. Sure. Bam, bam was pretty much bam, bam. Flames for hair is just incredible. So, um, bam, bam, Bigelow, uh, was an episode. I'll just say real quick that, um, it was like, 
kind of like with the Road Warriors episode we did in season two, it was kind of like, I don't even care what the story is. Like, I just love, you know, Road Warriors, Bam Bam. We'll just do, we'll just do the episode. We'll just find the story. And we were very surprised along the way. Um, we got all of his family in the episode, um, you know, his, 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 his ex-wife, his children. And it's, was just uh, very eye opening, um, just about Bam Bam's last, you know, um, his last years. And it, it's a wild ride. I did not expect this to be as emotional and as intense as it really is. So I think a lot of fans are going to be pretty surprised with that as well. Um, and then kind of saving the craziest for the last, um, the finale episode for season four will be Marty Janetti. <laughs> Do I need to say anything how, else? How many? <laughs> How many capital crimes did he confess to on camera? <laughs> well, oh man, um, it's hard to quantify. Um, <laughs> but um, no, I, I mean, I'm just, yeah, I'm messing around. But the the episode is very unique for us in a lot of ways. I'll just say this, you know, I mean, Jim, you know this. Most of the time we just show up, we we're, we're there for one day, we do an interview, it lasts a couple hours and, and that's it. And we knew that if we were going to do a Marty Jannetty episode, we had to embed, you know, in, you know, <laughs> Marty Jannetty land for at least four days. So that's what we did. We actually spent a lot of time with Marty, um, living in his, you know, natural habitat there <laughs> where he is. And, um, you know, he's an incredible amount of pain, um, from all of his injuries. We actually interviewed his doctors and his doctors, we asked them, um, you know, on a scale of one to 10, what's the amount of pain that Marty is in on a day-to-day basis. And they were like 12, you know, Jesus. pretty, pretty, yeah. You know, and you'll see it in the episode, you'll kind of see what's going on there, but it, it really gets in obviously to the roller coaster ride of his rise, you know, with the rockers and Shawn Michaels and all that stuff, but it kind of gets into, this story of, you know, after the rockers break up and yes, he had all these other opportunities that he kind of squandered and self-sabotaged, you know, because he did have a history with drug abuse and other things like that and just general craziness. But, um, it sort of does get into this almost alternate universe, dare I say, that he kind of creates, um, in an attempt to still remain relevant or to provoke or to be provocative or to still stay in some sort of fictional world, you know, that he's manifesting through Facebook. Um, but as we'll learn, cause I don't want to give it all away. Of course, we're going to, you, you're sort of going to learn that, um, there is some level of truth to some of the things that he's put out there. Maybe not an exact one-to-one -one truth. Let's just say, <laughs> so it's a little interpretive. Uh, I, I will are, say there are alternative truths that can be <laughs> It depends well, on just, you know, it depends on which side of the looking glass you're on. There you go. And 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 we we I think we landed on the perfect title for the episode, which is The World According to Marty Jannetty. <laughs> <laughs> it's the name of the episode. Oh, so God. so that's going to be a, a wild ride. So you'll definitely want to tune in for that one. You should tune in for all of them, but you know, I think we're all going to be kind of wor working our way to that episode. Just that now, is it true also that that Vice has spent all of their last remaining available cash on a a device that if you just tune onto their channel one time, it, it will not allow you to change the channel and get off that ever again. So you'll just be stuck on Vice, but you'll be able to see all ten weeks of Dark Side of the Ring. There you That's go. That's a rumor man, I heard. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I don't know. All, I don't know. All righty, anyway, I don't know what you're talking about. We better we better move it along here, but Evan, thank yeah. you very much again. It's a dark side of the ring season four vice TV while it lasts folks, get it while it's hot Tuesday <laughs> nights at 10 PM Eastern for the next 10 weeks. We're going to be overjoyed with a plethora of pro wrestling programming and Evan, I appreciate it. And, uh, we will have you back here either to answer for things. If, if there's some controversy or to, Again, discuss season five if indeed that does take place. You never right. know in this modern world. You never know. You never know. Every day is another day. So uh, thank you guys uh, so much for having me back. Always, always a blast. And thank you, Jim, uh, for always being, uh, you know, the star of Dark Side. Appreciate that. And um, yeah, we'll talk to you next time. It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. It was great to see <laughs> your back, Evan, especially after seeing your front. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. I'll show you my front anytime. <laughs> <laughs>
All righty, that was the conversation that I had with Evan Husney uh, just hours ago, and we bring that to you now, and we encourage everybody to watch Dark Side of the Ring this week and all of the next couple of months, just like we encourage everybody to remember that Father's Day is coming up, Brian. And Father's Day, for anybody, any male person in your family can be a either a father or a su grandfather, a substitute father, or a bad motherfucker, whatever the case. <laughs> a guy in your life deserves some fucking meat. Give a guy in your life some meat for Father's Day this year, because what's the way to a man's heart? It's through his stomach. It better be through his stomach. He doesn't want you going through most of the other orifices. It depends on who you are. But anyway, right now, Father's Day is coming up, and that's why that Omaha Steaks, our friends over there in the state of Omaha, have got numerous packages of all kinds of delicious meats and various items that dads would want for Father's Day, whether you're grilling or whether you're inside broiling or frying or whether you're out in a boat fishing somewhere, just gnawing on this stuff raw. I just got my Omaha Steaks package the other day. Brian, I know you did. They've got the fork tender bacon wrap filet mignons. They've got air chilled boneless chicken breasts. They've got the pork chops, burgers, jumbo franks, even the dessert like the caramel apple tartlets. And as we mentioned, it you don't need an excuse to give the man in your life, whatever your relation is, food, meat, carnivorous items. Because I went over the list here the other day. You don't want to give him like a bottle of booze. He could get drunk, go out, crash into a wall. That'd be it for dad. Or you give him a fishing pole. He goes out in a boat. He's still drunk. He falls out of the boat. He drowns. That's it for dad. Give him a gun. He could shoot his eye out even if it's just a Red Ryder BB gun. So give him the safe alternative. There's no way that he can harm himself unless he takes this frozen meat that comes to you, flash frozen, ready to go, vacuum sealed, ready whenever you are to defrost and cook. The only way he can hurt himself with this mouth-watering meat goodness is if he puts it in a sock while it's all frozen and bashes his own self over the head. That's the only, and also... Not advised. Well, that's the thing. These bacon-wrapped filet mignons especially, if you put them in a good, tall dress sock and tie a knot around it, it's better than a fucking hockey puck when it's frozen. You can knock a son of a bitch into next week with one of these things. I said not advised. You said that's the thing, and then you exactly ignored I what i said yeah, yeah that's the thing and i haven't advised you said it's not been advised well i took care of that i advised it no it's not advised not it's not been advised anyway. oh i thought you meant i was slacking off and i should have advised people earlier that the best thing to do with these bacon wrapped filet mignons before you eat them while they're still frozen is eat them put them in a sock wrap that thing up and like a bolo just swing it and bam and you you can defend yourself you don't even need any other type of weaponry Put it in your freezer and then like a bolo onto the grill and then into your stomach. Enjoy yes, it. It's delicious. Put it in your mouth and suck on it. The mouth-watering juices. I mean, I'm talking, these things taste great however you like them. Rare, medium, well done. Knock the horns off and bring it out on a leash. However you like to prepare these things. The Omaha Steaks packages are the thing to get for dad, for Father's Day, or grandpa, or son, or brother. Or a suspicious neighbor that keeps peeking over the fence. You go right now to omahasteaks.com and you select from all of the hand curated gift packages that they've got. There's different amounts of different kinds of meats and things. And that's what you do omahasteaks.com. Pick out the package you want and get $30 off your qualifying order. Now, there may be a minimum purchase required, but nevertheless, you will right now go to omahasteaks.com and save $30 off your package with the promo code JCE. omahasteaks.com, $30 off with the promo code JCE. $30 is like what? That's a half a cow. 
Have or at cow. least it's a good piece of a pig or whatever type of meat that you prefer. That's a lot of it. Have you, as Frank Morell said to me one time, boy, have you ever seen $50 worth of ham and eggs on a plate? No, you haven't. Nobody has. But I'll tell you what you will see. You'll see $30 extra in your bank account after you get one of these OmahaSteaks.com packages when you purchase it with the promo code JCE. That's what you'll see. Brian, have you ever seen $50 worth of ham and eggs on a plate? I have not. I'm not a fan of either, so no. You don't like eggs. Not a big ham fan either, no. You're not a fan of ham. Sounds what terrible. What about bacon? Bacon's all right. Well, bacon is just crispy ham. Ham sucks. Well, now, what did a pig ever do to you? I've, I've, you know, I've talked to three or four pigs that had good things to say about you. Yeah, behind the dumpster. I know all about that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, and all of them were wanting to see you again. Listen, I have no problem with pigs. I like bacon. I like sausage. I'm not a fan of ham. Well, what do you eat with your eggs? I don't eat the steak eggs. Steak and eggs? Unless the oh, eggs are in the like French toast, either. I don't need to eat the what eggs. Did, what did those chickens do to you? You like chicken? Are we in Reggie's Corner or are we talking about well, Omaha Steaks? The fine, do you like, fine... Do you like chicken? I love chicken. Well, uh, then why don't you like eggs? Because eggs is a chicken embryo. Does it taste the same as chicken? It's going to grow up to be a chicken. Does it taste the same as chicken? Folks, at OmahaSteaks.com, you can grow up to be any animal you want to be and get $30 off for Father's Day with the promo code JCE. And don't neglect your ham.